And uh, tonight we are going to look into Proverbs 28, 13. We've called it the choice, confess, or conceal. Let's stand together as we read that verse, Proverbs 28, 13. We've got just a few more lessons in the book of Proverbs. This is not an exhaustive study. This is a topical study. And uh, we'll have a couple more to go. And then we'll probably be moving into something more seasonal, uh, Lord willing. And if the Lord tarries, praise the Lord. But, uh, but uh, through Thanksgiving, we'll probably be here in the book of Proverbs. All right. So Proverbs 28, 13. If you're there, say amen. amen. If not, say wait on me. All right, we're ready to go. Proverbs 28 and verse 13. Let's read it together. <clears throat> All right, in concert. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. One more time. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Proverbs. Thank you for the truths that you have given to us, and hopefully we have taken from this uh, great book. I pray, Lord, that you'll take my lips and speak through them, take our minds and think through them, and take our hearts and set them on fire. Lord, with a love for you and a love for all people in Christ's name, Everybody say amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. So if we would all be 100% transparent tonight and honest, how many could say we've all been here in that text? The exact place that that verse describes because it's where we did something wrong and soon realized that we blew it, and we really messed up. We got any humans in here tonight? It is at that moment that we find ourselves standing at a crossroads of sorts. Uh, we can come out and confess it, or we can try to cover it up and conceal it. So confess or conceal, the choice is ours. So let's first, uh, let's deal with the choice to conceal, all right? That's the first point we're going to look at tonight. And I want you to notice the first thing we naturally want to do when we sin is to what? Conceal it. Because among our many uh, self-centered remedies for the problem of sin is our feeble attempt to find a cover-up. How many can recall, and let your mind go back to the book of Genesis, where Adam and Eve tried it first? Hmm? All the way back there in the garden, their act of concealment uh, was followed in many other books of the Bible, many other passages, and of course, all throughout secular and sacred history. Uh, there's a history of cover-ups. And I think God knew we would find concealment as an option, so that's why he said in Numbers chapter 32, 23, he said, be sure your sin will find you out. Does anybody remember Enron? It was the uh, Wall Street darling, I guess you could call it, that by the fall of the year 2000 uh, had started to crumble under its own weight because uh, CEO Jeffrey Skilling had a way of hiding, concealing, the financial losses of the trading business and, and other operations of that huge company. He along, obviously, I'd say he had some help. He, along with his assistants, chose to conceal billions of dollars in debt. 
You know, I, I was thinking of that this afternoon. I just don't know how you do that. I mean, brothers, most of our wives find out if we spend 20 bucks at Cabela's. <laughs> huh? So I don't know how you hide billions of dollars from your board of directors and then pressure others to pretend it's not happening. Wow, it's puzzling to say the least. Uh, then in 2002, how about uh, telecommunications giant WorldCom committed up to that time what they said was the largest accounting fraud in U.S. history with a $11 billion scheme. $11 billion. Don't fall out with me, but let's move over into politics just want to be reminded I want us to be reminded of how pervasive how and large scale this temptation to conceal things can be remember oh uh, Rod Blo what's his name Blavoyevich from I believe he's the former governor of Illinois I mean you know, I'd be tempted to say something about his hair, except mine's getting real thin. So we just leave that one alone. But Governor of Illinois, I think he was there from 2003 until January of 2009 when he was impeached for attempting to uh, sell uh, Barack Obama's open Senate seat. They said he was actually taking bids, or shall we say bribes, on a Senate seat, so he, he gets busted, gets convicted, and sentenced to, I think it was 14 years in the federal prison. Then you got Mark Sanford, former governor of uh, South Carolina, used taxpayer money to fly to South America to be with his mistress. So he's using the state's money to fly first class set up hotel rooms, rent houses in Argentina so he can be with a woman who was not his wife. The list could go on and on. How about William Jefferson, congressman in Louisiana? He did or said something to tip the authorities off about some kind of corruption, so they launched an investigation. When they raided his home, they found 90, 90 G's in his freezer. Talk about cold cash. I, I don't know what 90 grand looks like, but I'm guessing it was a pretty good size freezer. He was later sentenced to 13 years in federal prison for bribery and corruption charges following that investigation. How does all this happen? Well, I think the writer of this text in Proverbs would say they happen because we have, as human beings, an inbred propensity to hide, to conceal, and to cover up our sins. Hello. We all have an inclination to hide our mistakes and missteps, whatever the cost. I remember working construction years ago, uh, and uh, we were getting ready to close on a brand new home, and we were, uh, a co-worker and I was uh, trying to get the refrigerator in to its position in the kitchen, and um, in in the haste, he, he tried to move it by himself, and and ripped the linoleum brand new vinyl and so he said I'm just going to take a two by six and I'm going to cut it and I'm going to put it behind the refrigerator so it can't go back any further to reveal that tear I said you'll do what yeah and and you know, newsflash, we may deceive ourselves and feel that the cover-up worked. But ultimately, how many know a price will be paid? Now, how many of us has noticed that sin is often wrapped in lovely packaging? 
but it carries a significant price tag to those who make its purchase. And the truth is, really, uh, rarely do we feel worse than when we're trying to conceal some kind of sin. Our text uses the idea of not prospering. That's a pretty accurate way to describe it. I would also describe it as, as tiring. It's an anxiety-inducing state of paranoia. Which is why the wisdom writer notes a few verses earlier in our same chapter said, The wicked flee when no man pursueth. So concealing or hiding sin requires us to think about our sin constantly. Are you getting that down? Which then makes us think that everyone else must be thinking about our sin as much as we are. I'm talking about paranoia. You know, simple, unrelated comments make us think that, oh man, maybe we've been found out. And our guilty conscience says, how did they know what I was trying to hide? And when this happens, we turn and we exit the conversation, leaving that poor, unaware person wondering, what's up with them? Did I say something wrong? How many know that's not a way to live life? We all know that experience may be from varying degrees. I can recall several little instances growing up. And, you know, for me... It was mom. She could always see right through it. Huh? Hiding sin drains us of our resources. It can eat at us. How many has found out that living a lie gets very tiresome? And in a sense, we have no energies left to invest in anything or anyone else for fear of being exposed or found out. All of our energy is invested in covering up our own uh, sin and issues. And a good example of this uh, is, is, I was thinking this afternoon, when we, when we choose to uh, speed while we're driving, you know, it's a difficult thing to sit back, put on an easy listening CD and enjoy the beauty of God's creation uh, if you're speeding because your energy is spent on the lookout, Huh? For the next police officer who might ruin our day with a high price ticket. However, if we drive the speed limit, then we can sit back and relax, knowing we have nothing to fear or hide. Newsflash true, true peace is never available in deception. True peace is never available in deception. Now, there's a false peace. There's a false sense of security that may be found temporarily, but it soon disappears like the morning dew out on your lawn. It's very uh, temporary. In fact, unfortunately, we can find ourselves frantically falling deeper and deeper into sin in these instances, being in this state of deception. And, and really, what I want us to see is, is we should contrast that with the freedom that comes with just being open before God. Because notice on your worksheet, concealing our sins that are not hidden from God anyway only hurts us in the long run. You know, the, the saints of old used to say, what you do in the dark will come to the light. Remember that old saying? Boy, how true it is. For example, let me use uh, 2 Samuel 11. We find David, and he's in one of these kind of situations. Okay, he's just had an affair with Bathsheba. And he's gotten word that she is now expecting his child, no doubt. And he finds himself in quite the Hollywood dilemma. He could go ahead and confess, but there's a lot at stake and in David's mind, he's got to find a cover-up for this. And so he found out what we find out in these types of situations, which is this. The way to deal with sin in these type of situations is more sin. The way to deal with deception is more deception. 
Huh? So what followed was an incredible cover-up that not only cost a man, Uriah, his life, it cost other lives too. And throughout the rem- remaining life of, of David, we see that this cover-up would end up costing a lot to him personally and as to the nation nationally. Yes, David issued an authentic confession, and God showed him mercy. When God forgives you, you're forgiven. Amen. But his sin still had a price. His son died. His other children rebelled against him that we don't have time to go into. You remember Nathan the prophet's prophecy and how it came true when he said, The sword will not depart from thy house. How many know sin's not a luxury? It is a serious liability that affects generation after generation after generation. And for a moment's pleasure, we are inviting trouble in the generations to come. So so in the story of David, we learn a very important principle. Notice on your worksheet, the immediate consequences of confession are always far less than the delayed consequences of the cover-up. Now, there are people everywhere from all walks of life who have lived out the consequences of a cover-up. They would tell us that whatever we think we are avoiding by not confessing does not compare to what we are losing every day of our life by concealing. And the good news is that we have a God that loves us and wants us to live free from shame, guilt, and inner turmoil that comes and that's always attached to the deceit of a cover-up. Now, if we will begin our confession to him, he will forgive us and and set us on the path to freedom, as 1 John 1, 9 says. But those who are not prepared to confess those sins before God end up on that slippery slope of trying to conceal them. And it's it's like a, a heavy backpack that just keeps getting heavier and heavier, if you know what I mean. I mean, we might look good in front of others for a little while, you know, even standing up straight under the weight of it, but soon it's going to be obvious that there is a heavy backpack of sin attached to us. Ever wonder why it's hard to drop the backpack of unconfessed sin and receive what Christ has done for us? Often it's because of pride. Everybody say pride. Pride is we want to look good and believe the lie that if we confess, we'll look worse. Well, guess what? We were all sinners by nature. But we are transformed into saints by our new nature, granted to us by God's forgiveness and redeeming grace and mercy. And the difference between the sinner and the saint is that one has confessed and dealt with their sin while the other is still trying to hide and conceal it. And the beauty of the cross is that we are clearly judged to be sinners but given a new identity as redeemed children of God, joint heirs with Christ. We do not have to hide our sin. We do not have to justify it because Christ paid the penalty for it. Oh, somebody just give God some praise. Aren't you glad you've been forgiven tonight? Praise God. So he disposes our sin. What's the scripture say? As far as the east is from the west, he covers it with his shed blood, which is really the only successful cover-up in entire history. (laughs) Amen. If you've had, uh, you know, if you've been covered by the blood, we have reason to celebrate. We have reason to worship God tonight. Praise God. Because however until we reach heaven, we, the redeemed, we are going to wrestle with the realities of the old flesh. Just read Romans chapter 7. This body of death, Paul said, it's like it's attached to me. Who shall deliver me? The apostle Paul in another place says, I die every Sunday. Huh? Monthly? Daily. I die daily in regard to the flesh. So it does us no good, really, to be pretentious about our sin. It's useless to pretend that we are better than we are because any and all of our cover-ups are 
unsuccessful. Okay, so that's point number one. Point number two, the choice to confess. Now, I thought it interesting. Some time ago, I, I read about a minister who, who, who stated not only that there's a plan A for salvation, he said, which requires us to confess, repent, believe on Christ, but he went on to say that he feels, he feels there's also a plan B that it will cover those who are never quite able to forsake their sin, but rather continue in them. And so he said that he feels that in the end, they will still be saved due to God's love, mercy, and grace that always wins in the end. Now, that's an awesome and amazing concept, isn't it? Too bad it's totally unbiblical. Too bad it's totally un. Scriptural. I've never seen that alternate plan in the Bible, have you? I haven't. The truth is, turn to your neighbor and say, there is no plan B in the Bible. <laughs> because God's infallible word tells us there's only one plan of salvation. We must confess our sins and repent with godly sorrow and believe in order to be saved. Not only are we to do these things initially, but how many know we, we sometimes continue that practice of confession? We have to continue that practice of confession and faith throughout our Christian lives. These terms like confess and repent means to agree with God. And agree with God's view of our sin and agree with God's view of the fall and the redemption through Christ, His Son. And thus true confession and true repentance is to agree with God's view of reality and to, de and to declare it publicly by our lip and by our life. And confession means dragging our sins out of the darkness and into the light, the one place they hate to be. Needless to say, this requires humility because in our pride, we would rather that no one knows how bad of a sinning rascal we can be. Hello. But it also requires courage. And in the gospel, we find both humility and courage. See, confession is the opposite of what Satan does. Satan never repents. He never confesses, but only contradicts the divine view of reality, and he tries to shackle us to that same unrepentance and that same unconfession. And so I want us to look at some noteworthy observations. Letter A, true confession of faith is always accompanied by confession of what? Amen. Because as a Christian confesses his faith in Christ, he also necessarily confesses his sin and his guilt, because such confession has several uh, aspects, I guess you could say. And, and first of all, we have to make that confession before God. In Psalm 51, for example, David says in verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God. In verse 4, he says, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. Every sin is against God and is against his holiness, his nature, his revelation, and therefore we must confess before him. And may we never, may we never dumb down our sin or define down our sin. Whether it's big or small, every sin is a contradiction of God and is an expression of enmity against him. And so that is why there is no plan B for salvation. Salvation without confession and repentance is a lie, right? It is a fabrication of those who base their preaching not on the Bible, but on psychology and sociology and changing cultural trends. leads us to point to where are we at letter b god will aid us in confessing our sin well that's good news because here's the fact no one will confess sin without the holy spirit the holy ghost first convicts us that's god sending us he's aiding us by sending us the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts. 
How many has ever felt conviction? Raise your hand. Oh, good. So God aids us by sending the Holy Ghost to convict. Now, notice, God next will also convict us through painful chastisement. We read about this aid in Psalm 32. If you want to look there in verse 3, David says, When I kept silent, that is, he's saying, when, when I refused to repent and confess, when I was blaming others instead of uh, myself and, 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 uh, and I was covering up my own sin, when I kept silent, what did he say? My bones waxed old. In the Hebrew, it simply means wasted away. Through my groanings all the day long. I think in uh, our text it says through our roaring all of the day long. Through his roaring. And in the Hebrew there the word where he uses for bones actually stands for the whole body. It's a, it's a euphemism. And David speaks of a similar situation in Psalm 51, 8 saying that God has broken or has crushed him. That is God's divine assistance, his aid to get us to confess. David continues in Psalm 32. He says, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture, in other words, in the Hebrew, it means my strength was turned into the heat or the weakness of summer. Here, the saving hand of God is giving him aid, convicting and pressuring him, saying, you can't live concealing this sin any longer. And what was the result? Verse 5. The result of the hand of God being heavy upon him was verse 5. He says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee. Somebody say, praise God. We can be arrogant and we can be stubborn at times and we may at times desire the endorsement of the world more than the approval of God. And when that happens, we need the Holy Ghost to put the pressure on us. And how many know the that the Holy Ghost knows how to do it. Huh? Now, otherwise, God, God may give us aid in changing as he did the church of Corinth. 1 Corinthians 11.30 declares, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and look at this, and many sleep. And that's not just catching some Z's. That's the sleep of death. That divine aid is never pleasant. Huh? So God can, through chastisement, he can touch our bodies, our families, our possessions, our finances, every other aspect of our being. But because of God's infinite love for us, thankfully, he does not leave us in our sin. Is this okay? Okay, letter C. Confession is the prelude to and condition for forgiveness. Boy, I've got to hurry. And we read about this in several places. Psalm 32, 5, 66, 18, Mark eleven twenty five, First 1 Peter 3, 7, 1 John 1, 9. As I quoted before, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So confession is the prelude, right? It's the condition for forgiveness. Our forgiveness is based upon the sacrifice of Christ that is applied to our lives when we confess our sin. And, and then letter D, confession is the prelude to and condition for healing as well. James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. That includes physical, spiritual, emotional, maybe even psychological healing. It is amazing how much healing, how much Freedom, release, and peace we do not experience because we refuse to confess. James says sometimes confession to each other is prescribed. This is especially important when we sin against another person, right? Some sins we confess to God only 
and God alone. But some sins must be confessed to others as well if we've sinned against them. If we realize someone has ought against us, for example, we must go and take care of it. Matthew 5.23 says, before we come to worship. You know, it's interesting to note that because the Roman Catholics required confession to be made to a priest, many Protestants respond by saying that they don't have to confess to anyone but God. But like I said, if the sin was against God, you confess to God. If your sin was against your brother, you need to go to your brother. Right? Because, now look, confess rather than conceal, because the text says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. In other words, the concealer will remain a failure. He will never succeed, while the confessor will succeed and prosper. Praise God. Confess and prosper. Confess and be healed. Confess and enjoy the divine liberation from the shackles of your hidden sin. Letter E. Concealing sin leads to death. Oh, check it out. Joshua 7.21 illustrates that. Achan was the Israelite who clearly knew God's will, but by his actions he basically said, God's will doesn't matter to me. And when he saw the beautiful Babylonian garment and some silver and gold in the ruins of Jericho, he coveted them. The Bible says he took them and hid them and refused to confess. But no one can conceal anything from God's sight. Achan was finally forced to confess. But let me say this. Such forced confession seldom leads to life. Because when Achan's guilt was exposed, the Israelites... What they do? They stoned them to death in an administration of divine judgment. May God help us. I'll come back to that in a moment. I think I've got another subject, to, uh, another point to make there, but maybe later. Letter F, confession must be specific. When we confess our sins... Don't do so in a vague, general manner. If the Holy Ghost is truly helping us, we'll confess those issues and say, God, I messed up right here. Because Leviticus 5, 5 commands, it says, And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things, that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing. That's the, that's the verbiology of the text. Numbers 5.5, 5, when a man or woman shall commit any sin and that person be guilty, then they shall confess their sin, which they have done. We know exactly how we have sinned, thus our confession must be specific. How many times do we go to somebody and say, if I've ever said anything wrong, if I've ever offended you, huh? Yeah, you know. So, so we know exactly how we have sinned, thus our confession must be specific, and after confession we must trust in Christ's sacrifice for the forgiveness of that sin. And, and no sin can be forgiven except through faith in the atonement of Christ. You remember the, the goat in Leviticus chapter 16 on the day of atonement uh, that the priests placed their hands on and, and, and pretty much placed the sins of the people on that goat. One goat was sacrificed, one goat was the scapegoat, and was turned loose, and, and as the goat uh, went out of sight, the people would rejoice because their sins were gone. Well, that goat foreshadowed who? Christ. Because John says here, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And no confession will secure forgiveness unless we trust in Christ's atonement on the cross. But when we do so, He'll forgive our sins, and that leads us to letter G. Confession involves forsaking. Somebody say forsake. That means discontinue. That means renounce our sin. We cannot come to God and continue to be greedy, continue to lie, continue 
to be a thief, continue to be a homosexual, continue to be an adulterer, continue to be an alcoholic or a porn-addicted pervert. The text says you've got to forsake the sin. True repentance means turning away from the evil, turning to God. So That's why Paul told the church at Ephesus in 428, let him that stole steal no more. Christ told the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. And the Bible has no plan B that will allow us to come to God while continuing to sin. That's a false gospel. And how many know it's being proclaimed? We must forsake. You know, when Jacob was told to go to Bethel to worship the living God, he understood that principle. Because right after God gave him direction to go back to Bethel, what did he do? He gave the direction to his household, and he told him, give me all your idols. And the Bible says he buried them there before moving on. In Genesis, I think it's verse 35. Boy, aren't you God our glad? Aren't you glad our God is a God of holy living? Because of him, the the what was it? The heavenly beings in Isaiah 6 3 says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And when Isaiah saw the, the Lord, he cried out and he said, Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And, and it's this thrice holy God who commands us, Be ye holy, for I am holy. You know, how dare we come to God and say, I want to keep all my sins. We'll, we'll, we'll let you in. We want you in our life, Lord, but we're going to keep all of our sins. Matthew one twenty one says you'll be called Emmanuel and he will save his people from their sins. And the gospel is the power of God that does that. H, letter H. True confession will result in obedience. Now when somebody confesses biblical doctrine and yet lives a wicked life, how many know that confession is false and insincere? It's merely an attempt to fool both God and man. True confession will always produce obedience to God's word. And in 2 Corinthians 9, I think it's 13, Paul basically says, folks, we'll praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. If obedience does not accompany our confession, we've lied in the very presence of God. And in Acts 26... 20, Paul spoke of the obedience that results from true confession of faith. He said they should repent and turn to God and do works. Do works. Meet for repentance. In other words, in the New Testament times, there were people who made false professions. Titus 1.16, they profess that they know God, but in works, that's their actions, they deny him. Paul told Titus. So don't let them confuse you these people made orthodox confessions but they lived unorthodox wicked lives so true confession will always result in obedience to this word all right oh finally letter i true confession always results in restitution Holy Spirit-produced confession is always accompanied by restitution, and, and it even goes to the financial issues. Let's use Zacchaeus for a classic example. When he met the Lord, he declared, he said, in Luke 19.8, he says, uh, basically, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, which he knew he had, he said, I'll pay back how many fold? Fourfold. Fourfold. Wow. But there's other forms of restitution we can make as well. Suppose we spoke evil about somebody and we destroyed their reputation, but then we repented and confessed. We must do everything we can to restore that person's damaged reputation. If there's no restitution, then our repentance is not genuine. 
Too often we try to create a God of our, in our own image instead of us being created in his image. We create a God in our own image, in our own likeness, and we want a God that's hard of hearing and his vision's kind of blurry. So he can't see it all and he can't hear it all. But how many know God doesn't have blurred vision? He doesn't have a hard time hearing. He sees it all. He hears it all. He knows it all. And the wonderful thing is he's waiting to forgive and to heal us on the basis of that confession. No one can receive the living water of forgiveness, peace, joy, without confessing freely. For example, the publican in Luke 18 stands in contrast to the Pharisee. Remember that story? The Pharisee concealed all of his sins under the cloak of self-righteousness. In fact, he even reminded God about how nice he was. But did he find healing that day? Did he find redemption and salvation that day? The Pharisee didn't. In fact, he really probably didn't want salvation because he didn't see a need for it. But the other man, the publican, the Bible says he beat his chest. He would not even look up to heaven, would not even look to heaven. But he merely cried out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The publican was healed and saved and went home justified, the Bible says. Why? Because confessing brings the blessing. Amen. In conclusion, let me, uh, boy, I've got to hurry. We're concluding, all right? Four lessons that can help those struggling with concealed or secret sin. Number one, the pressures to pretend are real. Folks, you don't have to be a theologian to know the pull to pretend that you've got it all together. Because none of us likes to be exposed. Our shame always seeks asylum in the darkness, doesn't it? And our first parents knew this. That's why they scurried into the shadows of the Garden of Eden. Remember that the pressure you feel to look capable and, and impeccable, it, it, it's not from God. It's Satan who disguises himself as an angel of light. Don't, f don't fall for his call to conceal who you really are. The pressures to pretend are real. Secondly, hypocrisy must die. We can't follow Christ while pretending we don't really need him. If we don't take off the mask of hypocrisy and breathe in the air of honesty, our soul is going to shrivel. The deception is going to grow darker. We will begin to believe we are safe in our sin. Christ died for our hypocrisies and he rose from the dead to empower us to put the hypocrisy away. Thank you, Lord. Number three, time for honesty is now. So if we're hiding sin, we can come up with reasonable sound and excuses to wait until next time to get honest before God. Our flesh will freak out, reassuring us that we'll never do it again. Oh, I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. Don't ever fall for that trick. Because today is the day to confess it all. And Christ promised that everything done in the darkness will come into the light at God's judgment day. Yet there, there's mercy for those who bring it into the light on their own before they get to the judgment day. Because what did I say? I said forced confession rarely leads to life. Paul said, what did he say? Every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess. But I, I wonder how many is going to be forced confessions. Hmm? They're going to get there and they're going to be like, oh, wow, you are God. But God's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Number four. Finally, as Sister Jones comes. Christ will never leave us. Oh, I want to leave you with that comforting thought. No matter what honesty might cost us, Christ will be with us. 
He promises to never leave us or forsake us. In Hebrews 13, 5, he promises to complete the work that he's begun in us. He promises to walk with us through whatever dark days accompany our honesty. (laughs) I'm reminded of Jacob's story in Genesis. Jacob was a a, a clever fellow, and his very name means deceiver. And early on, he bartered with the birthright from Esau for the price of a cup of soup. Later, he deceived his father, and he stole Esau's blessing as well. Yet, see, see, Jacob was a crook. But God loved him, and Jacob had a tender heart. And God said, I can work with that. And when he fled from Esau, God appeared to Jacob and said, I'll be with you. I'll take care of you if you'll determine to follow me. In Genesis 32, some 20 years later, we find him on his way back to Canaan, preparing to meet big brother Esau after 20 years. And Jacob sent his wives and his children and all his possessions mainly ahead of him. And then Jacob said, he was, he's left alone. Yet, it says, a being came and began to wrestle with him. How many know that was the Lord himself? The Lord himself came to Jacob in the middle of his night and the Lord let Jacob look like he was winning this wrestling match. And and so it seemed that way until he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh. That means he touched the very seat of his strength. And instantly Jacob was crippled. He was handicapped. And as Jacob fell to his knees in pain, no doubt, he grabbed onto the Lord and realized this being that he had a grip on was superior to him. And he knew that the superior always blesses the inferior. Oh, did you hear me? So what did Jacob do? Hosea 12.4 recounts the story and tells us that he wept. He was crying out in supplication. And he asked this being, he asked the Lord to bless him. He said, I'll not let you go till you bless me. But wait a minute. The Lord will not bless us until we confess to him who we are. And so what was it next in the story? What did that being, what did the Lord ask Jacob? He said, what is your name? Now, how many know it wasn't that the Lord had a brief memory lapse? Eh? He wasn't wanting to see if Jacob would own up to who he really was. Yeah, 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 he was. So out of breath, and his hip is out of joint, in desperation, Jacob replies. He says, my name is Jacob, admitting he was a deceiver. And finally, at that moment... Jacob becomes a prince with God. Hello? From that point on, he is aware of who God was and what he needed to do, and that was he had to cling to God in total honesty and total transparency. So once again, if Jacob would be here tonight, he would agree, confessing, will bring the blessing. Let's stand together. Confessing will bring the blessing. So tonight, it's it's not a time to conceal the issue, church. It's not a time to conceal it. It's a time to confess it. Do you need to confess anything to the Lord tonight? Because, listen folks, repentance, faith, and confession are not a one-time thing. If you need them to be, they may have to be a daily experience for you for a while. If we're under the, under, under the influence of the Holy Ghost, we'll discover that our sin is not really going to be able to be hid. And then we'll seek God's forgiveness through ge- genuine confession. Will you take your hymn book and turn to page 293? I thought of this song earlier today, and I thought it, it was appropriate and it would fit, especially... The third verse, page 293, it's called Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Let me read to you verse 3. It says, dark is the stain that we cannot what? Hide. 
Dark, let's read it together. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is a flowing, a crimson tide, whiter than snow. You may be today. Give God some praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Grace, grace, God's grace. Sing it, church. And cleanse within all grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all. Let's sing that verse 3. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Oh, grace, grace, God. As you sing it, would you come? If you got to go, God bless you. I know I went over time. If you got to go, God bless you. If not, would you take a moment? Fall into these altars, kneel at your pew, take a moment, search your heart. Before you leave, make sure everything's okay between you and the Lord. Oh, grace, grace.